is able and uh, join me in the call to worship. From where will our help come? Our help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Who is our keeper? The Lord is our keeper, by day and by night. How will God protect us? God will keep our going out and never coming in, from this time on and forevermore. Now remain standing and join in with special music led by our Daybreak Band. The sun will rise, out of these ashes rise. From this trouble on the ground, from this rubble on the ground, I will rise. Yes, I will rise, out of these ashes rise. From this trouble on the ground, from this rubble on the ground, I will rise.
the Lord a round of praise. You know, uh, so it, it kind of hit me hard to know that Pastor Bob Davis passed away. Um, he was a huge mentor, and he didn't really have to do a whole lot, but he was someone who would, who could listen to me and could give me some very meaningful and spiritual and uh, loving advice. And, and so he really helped me kind of figure out my path, and it's because of him that I'm actually still here. So, you know, and, and when he went to, to Carson City, people were saying, well, Albert, are you going to stick around? I'm like, yes, of course I'm going to stick around. Because, uh, the, well, the one thing that uh, Bob, I felt, you know, like, his whole thing was like, the church is so much bigger, right? And so, you know, um, to serve God is the, the call, right? Not, not to chase, like, feelings or emotions or, um, and so, you know, and, and not to look, not to chase after a leader either, which was, uh, you know, it's really rare when someone impacts you, but at the same time, you don't feel like, oh, he's, like, he's the guy, but he's God's guy, and God is my guy, if that makes sense. So, um, as much as I, I'm so sad that he passed, you know, he, I feel like he went, God called him, but he was busy working for the Lord. And I say to God, God, when I pass, or when any of us pass, like, let us be, like, so busy just working for you. That one minute we're worshiping you here, and the next minute we're worshiping you, worshiping you up in heaven. And um, you know, Bob Davis has risen out of these ashes, and so uh, it's sad, but it's also joyful. So he is with the Lord. Anyways, I just wanted to, to share that, just because uh, why not? You are the family of God. So, all right, let's do a, one more song. So this one's about the power of the Holy Spirit. We're gonna celebrate communion later, and so uh, you know. Uh, it's important to remember that the Holy Spirit is with us and He is the power that helps us to go on, okay?
be seated and join me in the prayer of confession followed by, by the assurance of pardon. We cannot earn God's grace or favor. It comes to us not as something owed, but as a gift freely given. Confident in God's love for us, even when we are ungodly, we confess our sins. Gracious God, we come before you in need of forgiveness and grace. You call us to trust in your view completely, but we do not. We are timid and fearful as we follow our lead. We justify our actions and words. We struggle to understand the new life Christ offers, preferring old habits to risky change. Forgive us, we pray. Help us to be born again into the life of Christ, trusting that you have concluded with us grace and family of faith. Now please take a moment for your silent prayer of confession. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The assurance pardon is from Romans 5, verse 8. But God proves his love for us, and that while we still are for sinners, Christ died for us. Now please take a moment to greet your neighbors and pass the peace of Christ.
The Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, starting with the first verse, which, is on, which begins on page 10 of your blue Bible. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. This is the word of the Lord. thank my parents for being here from all the way from Fresno. Um, you may notice that my husband and one of my sons is not here this morning. They decided to go to Sacramento on the fourth grade trip to Sacramento. And this was a weekend when we were all gathered together in worship in our combined service. And I wanted to just get installed so I could officially, by the presbytery, officially be your pastor. So let, I said, let's do it this weekend, even though they're gone. George said I was supposed to make a joke about it, but I couldn't think of anything funny. So <laughs> there's, your, there's your joke. So I was just looking up what happens when a baby is first born. And do you know what happens when a, a baby is first born? Did you know that their whole body rewires itself? That when a baby is born in the first five minutes of their life, their heart completely starts working in a different way. So for us, the left side of our heart is the dominant side of our heart because it is the side that pumps the blood to the rest of our bodies. But a baby, when it's in their mother's, uh, in their mother, their right side of their heart is the dominant side of their heart. And the reason for that is because they get their nourishment from the umbilical cord. And within five minutes of the baby being born, the baby's heart completely rewires itself so that it can begin to breathe oxygen. I don't fully understand it, how it works. I read, it, I read it like six times on the internet. Somehow the right side becomes the less dominant side because it's the side that puts the oxygen low blood, into your lungs so that it can be oxygenated. But that's why a baby pinks up when it's born. It pinks up because now it is filled with all of this oxygen-rich blood. And babies, that is not the first thing that happens to them that is completely changes within the first few months of their life. Uh, there, are, there are pediatricians who call the first three months of their lives the fourth trimester. Now they call this the fourth trimester because babies go from, have you ever met a newborn baby? They are squishy and floppy and are kind of like this. And they go for, and they can see three feet in front of their face and they can only see in black and white. And within three months, they usually are starting to be a little bit more mobile. They can now see in color like you and I can see. But what happens is there's this transformation that takes place, and it kind of happens in two. With children, it happens in lots more than these two sections. But little babies, it happens in these two kind of profound ways. 
It's when they're first born and their whole body changes to, so that they can breathe oxygen. And then also in those first three months when they become, they are able to see like you and I and kind of start to live and be humans like you and I. I know Gregory didn't open his eyes, I swear, for the first three months of his life. I have no pictures of him with his eyes open because he didn't have anything to see. He just would cry and get fed and he'd change his diaper and then he'd fall asleep again. So it's so fascinating. And today, in our second week of Lent, we're going to be talking about what it means to be, as the NIV translates it, born again. But as the NRSV translates it, is born from above. Our lecturing passage is a very common passage that we know. It's, John's, it's from John's Gospel, the third chapter, where I'm sure that you memorized the 16th verse of that chapter when you were this tall. It is a verse that we all know that as young children we wrote upon our hearts. But the passage is actually a lot more complicated than that. And so we are going to talk more about what it means to be transformed in Jesus Christ. And we're going to talk about that through the words of Jesus and the words of Nicodemus. So I invite you to open your Bible up to the third chapter of John, which is page 94. And that will be the third chapter beginning at the first verse. Okay. I always like to tell you what happened before. So it says, now. Well, nothing had happened before that. We, <laughs> there wasn't, Jesus hadn't journeyed from somewhere to another. We just, we enter the scene right where we are. So it says, now, there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He, was, he came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom unless they are born from above. Now as I said before, if you read this in the NIV, it says born again. But I really like the NRSV translation because it clarifies the question that Nicodemus is going to ask next. And he said, Nicodemus says this, he says, how can anyone be born after they've grown old? How can one enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born? Remember, that's not what Jesus said. He said, be born from above. Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. So do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe it if I tell you about heavenly things? No one can ascend into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For all who hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true comes, come to the light 
so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done by God. This is the word of the Lord. So we start this passage in the dark. We start this passage in the dark because Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And we end this passage in the light. Of Jesus saying that those who come to the light have seen the light know the light. Now, who is this guy? Who is Nicodemus? Who is this guy who came to see Jesus? Now, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And he was a leader of the temple. And we see Nicodemus three times in John's Gospel. We see Nicodemus three times in John's Gospel. And each time we see him, he becomes, he comes a little bit more into the light. So the first time we meet him, he comes, I imagine, be cloaked in the dark and knocks on wherever Jesus is staying and then comes and asks him these questions. And the next time we see Nicodemus is in um, the, the seventh chapter, I think, I think it's 750. We see him in the seventh chapter and he kind of passively says, defends Jesus. And then, the next time we see him, Nicodemus comes out of the shadows. And he is the one who, in John's Gospel, gives the spices to Joseph of Arimathea when Jesus has died for his burial. And that, for Nicodemus, was a risky move. It was a risky move because he came into the light and said, I am a follower of Jesus, who has just been killed by crucifixion, a very gruesome, gruesome death. And the thing that I love about Nicodemus is that he was a profound man of faith, but he was also a searcher. He was searching for what God would have for him. He was searching for what the kingdom would be like. See, Nicodemus as a Pharisee, the, you know, in the Bible we meet the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were believers in the law, and they were very strict followers of the law, but they were also strict followers of the oral tradition as well. So how the law, the first five books of the Bible, had been interpreted. So there were right and wrong ways to do everything from the way that you genuflex, from the way that you walked places, from the way that you uh, were cleansed. I mean, there were rules upon rules upon rules upon rules. And it was all in an effort to seek God. It was all in an effort to know and be in relationship with God. And what Jesus does when Nicodemus comes by night is he challenges that ideal. See, most of the time that we meet the Pharisees in the scripture, they come in an adversarial position. They come trying to trick Jesus, to try to make him say something. But what happens here is that Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, comes seeking. And he's seeking the light of God through Jesus Christ because he sees that there is something different about this Jesus. There is something different about the things that Jesus is preaching. And so Nicodemus then begins to step out of the darkness and in to the light. Now, one of the conversations that Jesus has with Nicodemus is this whole conversation about being born from above or, or as we know it, being born again. Now, I think there are I want to go back to the babies when we talked about the babies. So I know for some people, they've had that born again experience where they had a light in the darkness and they were born again in Jesus Christ. But then there are some who it was a slow and gradual process that they came to know Jesus Christ. Their parent brought them to church. Their friend continued to talk to them about it. It wasn't like a lightning bolt transformation experience. 
And that's kind of how it is with babies. They're, they do have that born experience where their whole body rewires, but then they also, as humans, slowly grow into who they're supposed to be, into who God created them to be. And that's how transformation, I think for a lot of us, takes place in our lives. That even if we had the lightning bolt experience, most of our faith is that slow transformation into who God would have us be. That we are being transformed into who God would have us be, but it takes time and energy and imagination, and need I say, work. It takes work to continue to be the people that God wants us to be for that transformation to take place. But what? The risk that it takes is to stop being Pharisees. Now, why do I say that? In Scripture, usually when, when we read the Scripture, we're like, oh, we're not like those guys. Whew. We're not, whew, they're terrible, we're not like them. But we are. We as the church have gotten caught up in the way that things have always been. And I'm not indicting Chula Vista, I'm talking about the church universal. That we've gotten caught up in the way things have always been. Oh, we've always done it that way. Oh, if you do it this way, that's not church. Oh, it must be with fill in the blank, whatever your thing is in worship or how the church serves. But part of coming to know Christ is by willing to be transformed into something new. To be, as Jesus said, to be born from above. Because when we are willing to be born from above, we are willing to step into the light. To step into what Christ would have for us. But that takes risk. Nicodemus risked by coming in the middle of the night, which sounds, you know, a little not brave, but it was. He risked for his faith. He risked for what he was seeking. And I think what we as the church need to do is to risk to be different. To risk to have open eyes and open ears and open hearts to people that we have not welcomed. To open the doors widely to all who are called. Because when Jesus says in John 3.16, he says, For God so loved the world. It does not say, for God so loved this list of people and everyone else is out. It says, for God so loved the world. So we as followers of faith and followers of Jesus and people who in our identity say that we are Christians, which means followers of Jesus, need to be willing to risk need to be willing to step out in faith, and need to be willing to live by that verse that we wrote on our hearts when we were kids. For God so loved the world. Because that's how we will be the light of Christ. Friends, will you pray with me? God, our helper, we thank you for keeping our lives always in your care and protection and pray for any and all who are in harm's way. We pray for those who are walking in the midst of danger, for those who are treading a slippery path. For those 
who are exhausted and seek relief. For those who face a mountain of worry, or debt, or obstacles, be guardian and guide, we pray, setting all our feet on your path of righteousness and peace. We pray for those who are struggling with a new challenge or call, with a major transition in life or livelihood with their faith and understanding, with grief, both ancient or new. And we pray especially for the family of Bob Davis and all who have been impacted by his ministry. Keep in our tender care and mercy, O oh God, those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, those weighed down by depression or pain, those recuperating from surgery or accident. Protect not only the us and those we love, but also those, the whole wide world, you love so. In places of war, bring peace. We especially pray for Ukraine for those in places by natural disaster, bring calm and restoration. We pray especially for those who are still stuck in the snow in the Sierra Nevadas. We are thankful for the snow and the much needed relief from our drought. But we pray for those whose livelihoods are at stake. And we also pray for those in Palestine, Ohio too, as they continue to recover from that terrible, terrible train wreck. Where there is unrest and injustice, make justice our aim. Where hope has grown tired and thin, lift our sights so that we may hope beyond hope, life beyond death. And you lifted before us light um, in the name of Christ, who gave us himself for our sake. And we pray in the way you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. And now let us stand as we sing hymn number 522, my favorite ordination in the installation hymn, Lord, When I Came Into This Life.
reading in the right and proper order. Today, on this communion Sunday, we have to do a confession. So please let us continue to worship as we proclaim what we believe using the Apostles' Creed printed in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now you're up, Alan. Sorry. <laughs> you all can be seated. Thank you. Okay. And now the time has come for the official installation of our new pastor, Reverend Liz Wilson Manahan. And the, to preside over their, this proceedings, we are delighted to welcome and, we, and uh, introduce M. Cummings, Vice Moderator of the San Diego Presbytery. And I'd also like to invite Irene Anza forward as well as Tommy, Tommy Finch forward too. There you go, do you want to use this? Okay. Yes. It should be. The button is pressed. Okay. Oh, nope. Try again. Try again. Okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, it's a delight and a privilege for me to be here. I've been here many times. I've been an elder in this presbytery, almost hate to say it, for half a century. <laughs> so I've had occasion to visit every church in our presbytery, including this one. I think the last time I was here, Angie McLean was still here and preaching in that pulpit. Of course, I knew Bob Davis very well, too. I grieve with you at his passing. Bob was the interim executive presbyter of our presbytery some years ago. I came to know him very well at that time because we worked together on a number of committees. And hearing of his passing was such a shock. And I, I grieve and uh, pray with you for his family and celebrate the fact that he is now in the arms of his Lord. Amen. Um, to be here for Pastor Liz is a special privilege. I've known Liz for many years and uh, look forward to this celebrative time. We are called out by God to be the church of Jesus Christ, a sign in the world today of the new life that God intends for all. In our life together, we are to display the new reality that sin is forgiven, reconciliation accomplished, and the dividing walls of hostility torn down. As the living body of Christ, the church is called to proclaim the good news of salvation, to present the claims of the gospel on people's lives, and to demonstrate Christ's love and service to the world. We are called to undertake this mission even at the risk of life, trusting God in all things. In faith, we embrace a new openness to what God is doing in our time, a renewed obedience to our Lord Jesus Christ, and a new joy in our common worship and work. Today we reclaim our historic calling and remember the great ends of the church, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of heaven to the world. The ministry of the church is shared by pastor and people so that all together may fulfill the mission to which we are called in Jesus Christ. The particular responsibility of the ministry of the word and sacrament 
is to build up the church and serve the people of God so that the word may be rightly proclaimed and the sacraments rightly celebrated. The call to this ministry has been extended by the congregation, by you, accepted by the candidate, Pastor Liz. Therefore, the Presbytery of San Diego, by means of this commission, now installs Elizabeth Wilson Manahan as pastor of Chula Vista Presbyterian Church. May I hear some applause? Will the whole commission come forward now, please? In her baptism, Pastor Liz was clothed with Christ. Please come up. I'll, I'll be asking uh, Pastor Liz some questions in the presence of us all. She was ordained to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament by the Presbytery of San Joaquin and is now called by God through the voice of the church and the Presbytery of San Diego to serve as pastor of this congregation. We remember with joy our common calling to serve Christ. And we celebrate God's call to Pastor Liz to serve as pastor here in Chula Vista. And now I have some questions, some constitutional questions for Pastor Liz. As you know, we Presbyterians do things decently and in order. <laughs> and this is part of that process, which, even though it's decent and in order, is still joyous. <laughs> and so, Pastor Liz, I have some questions. Do you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of the Church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do and I will. Pastor Liz, Will you be a minister of the word and sacrament in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and continually guided by the confessions? I, is that it? I will, I will. <laughs> yes, I will. You will. <laughs> will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry working with them subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. Will you seek in your own life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? I will. And finally, Pastor Liz, my last question. <laughs> Will you be a faithful minister, proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving the governing bodies of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? I will with God's help. Amen. I would like to invite Elder Irene Einza now to come forward and address the congregation. Good morning. Now it's the congregation's turn. I have some questions for you. Do we, the members of the church, accept Pastor Liz Wilson Manahan as our pastor, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to guide us in the way of Jesus Christ? Do we agree to encourage her to respect her decisions and to follow her as she guides us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? 
Do we promise to pay her fairly and provide for her welfare as she works among us to stand by her in trouble and share in her joy? Will we listen to the word she preaches, welcome her pastoral care, and honour her authority as she seeks to honour and obey Jesus Christ our Lord? We do and we will. So, Tommy was not here when we ordained and installed the elders, so I have a question for you. Will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? And will you share in the government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say I will. I will. Wonderful. At this time, I would like to invite anyone who's an ordained elder or a minister of word and sacrament to come forward and lay hands on Liz, Pastor Liz, as we pray the prayer of installation. Looks like almost half the congregation. That's wonderful. <laughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us in this new era that we may be faithful as your people, authentic as human beings, and fruitful in the ministries you have given us. Grant diligence to Pastor Liz, faith to those who teach, truth to all who speak, compassion to all who heal, wisdom to those who counsel, generosity to those who give, and cheerfulness to all who serve. To your servant, Pastor Liz, and to all who tend your flock among your people, give vision and strength, perspective, wisdom, hospitality, a sense of humor, humility, and peace. Bless the ministry of Pastor Liz and this congregation with joy and power in the gospel. And finally, dear God, strengthen all of us to live out the grace of our baptism with authenticity, humility, and dignity as we serve you with the gifts of your Holy Spirit for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only shepherd and Lord. Amen. And now I'm going to invite Pastor Liz's father, Joe Wilson, Elder Joe Wilson, to come forward. I will hand him this microphone. And he has something to say to the rest of you. Joe, a pleasure. Thank you. First, Elizabeth, I thank you. Well, actually, <laughs> it did start during the service, so you have to understand. When the spirit starts moving, me, I can't help it. I'm sorry. You know. Whenever I think of you, I, I've been trying to think of a story that I wanted to think, tell of you. The story I want to tell you of and remind you of. Let me get a breath and turn around. Okay. Well, the first story I think of whenever I think of Elizabeth and her faith was a night we were at the Louis Palau uh, Evangelistics uh, Crusades. And we had gone there as a family. And my wife and my older daughter had gone down to pray with some of the peak counselors there and ask and for our oldest daughter to ask Jesus in her heart. Well, Elizabeth 
I said, you know, Elizabeth is staying by me over here, and you know, I'm, we're waiting on my wife and daughter who are down farther in the congregation with a, a group of people. And Elizabeth's going, Dad, 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 I want to go down. Dad, I want to go down. And, and what's interesting about that is that she went down, and that's when she said, Jesus, I want you to be part of my life. And God's hand has been on you ever since that day. What's also interesting to me, and I think it's important that we all realize that God has a long history with all of us. Because the lady that she met that night was a friend of mine who had been part of my young, teen, my teen, late teenage years and my early college years. I had sang in a group called Street Fine Singers. Her name was Ann Heinrichs. She prayed with you that night. We, as the church, it's important to remember we have history. And that history is connected to other people who then come into our lives. And there's never a closed circle, but rather a long-term connection to all of us from one generation to the next, to the next, to the next. I have struggled this week, or since you asked me to do this thing for you, to really come up with what I should be saying to you, because I'm not for sure always what I should say, because you know me, I'm a long-winded kind of guy. Uh, but in coming up with that, in coming up with that, <clears throat> there's some things that absolutely came to mind as I was doing that. And maybe, I'm not for sure this may be my journey, but not yours, but I'm going to share it with you because I think that it's an important thing to remember as the church and for you to teach the church. I have a quote that I now use oftentimes. This quote is, you are carriers of the light, bearers of the cross. Jesus said to the people of Israel who were listening to him on the, during the Sermon on the Mount, if you can imagine, these are people who live in Galilee, who've been living in, in, looking for hope, but they have not found it. And Jesus says to them in Matthew 5, uh, verses 3, uh, 13 through 16, he says to them, you are the light of the earth. You, uh, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, it cannot, uh, saltiness, how, how can it make, be made salty again? In this, in the, it is no longer, I need to get this up so I can read it. It is no longer salty. Uh, it is no good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled under the feet of humans and pigs and Depends on which version you read. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light, be light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and, your, and praise your Father in heaven. One of the things that <clears throat> you, you know is that there's a cook. Salt is important. Without salt, things taste terrible. But too much salt and the dish is lost. In the same way, you remember, in the same way, Christ, we Christians are salt uh, and are, uh, we're in the same way, the salt of Christian faith changes forever and whatever and whoever it comes in contact with. Do you remember our trip to Mercer Cavern whenever you were in what, fifth or sixth grade? I can't even remember. But we were at Cyclone Camp. They took us into this cavern. They turned out all the lights. And it was dark. I mean, you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. But remember what happens? When they turned on turned on the light of one flashlight, that darkness was forever changed. So it is with the light of Christ that within all Christians, 
when we carry the light of Christ into the world, we forever change the dark, dark places in the world by carrying that light into those dark places. Jesus said, uh, when he was talking to Nicodemus, he said, and I, I love this because remember, you, you talked about how Moses, how Nicodemus was a part of the oral tradition and knew the stories. What I love about this is he, he says to Nicodemus, do you remember when Moses lifted the serpent up in the wilderness and how all the people were healed? Jesus then says to him, the Son of Man will be lifted up in the same way in order for the people who believe in him, well, they will have eternal life. So Jesus prophesies right there in front of Moses, uh, Nicodemus, by using the words of, of, that he knew from the prophets and from, from the, the wilderness journeys. He said, this is going to happen to me, and I want you to pay attention that cross is an important thing in our lives. What I want you all to remember is during formal services, uh, the Christ candle is often carried into the congregation to serve as light for the service. The cross is carried in to draw people to the cross, to Christ. And the scriptures are also carried in for the purpose of telling the stories of God's faithfulness to all people. That at then, at the end of the service, the candle, the cross, and the scriptures are carried back out of the sanctuary and into the world so that the world will see the light of Christ, be drawn to the cross, and learn of God's faithfulness. Elizabeth, my charge to you is to teach the people of Chula Vista Presbyterian Church the hope of the gospel, the faithfulness of God and that they each will be, be a carrier of the light and bearer of the cross. And who, wherever they go, that, that the people will see, that wherever they go, that the people will see the light of Christ and will be drawn to him because of what they do. God bless you in this new endeavor, and may the Holy Spirit empower you, and may you rest in the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth, so that you will know his peace and you will, he will give you his grace and his wisdom because God promised, Jesus promised us, whenever I go away, I will send the comforter. And that comforter is the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit dwells in every believer. May you rest in his joy, his peace, and his hope. God bless you, my dear God. So, in preparation for this morning, I reached out to several church members who served with me on PNC. I felt strongly that the words that I share with you today be not just my words, but be our words as a congregation. And the question that I was challenged with was, what does the church have to look forward to under the leadership of our new pastor, Liz wilson Manahan? My initial thoughts were, where do we start? From our very first meeting, it was evident that Pastor Liz loved the Lord in every aspect of her life. It was front and center in all our conversations as we all listened attentively to her stories of faith and renewal, as well as hope for a congregation like ours. Her enthusiasm to share her faith was contagious. This, coupled with her very positive energy, made us all realize God had brought a very special leader to CBPC. I'm not going to look at her because I'm going to cry. And we were unanimous in our calling. Pastor Liz has an amazing resume and excels in so many leadership competencies that we felt were important to CBPC. She is a communicator, advisor, a decision maker, a strategist with vision, a pastor with personal resilience, and now a certified spiritual leader. She is intelligent, a real people person, has great technical knowledge, and possesses a willingness 
to make changes with a gentle touch. These are all great qualities that make Pastor Liz a great leader in our eyes. Pastor Liz brings energy, enthusiasm, vitality, experience, and youth to the demands of a senior pastor. In the short time she has been on campus, we have witnessed an energy back in the congregation and are already seeing the difference she is making on the campus and in the lives of the congregation. With Pastor Liz, we look forward to proactive and hands-on leadership as we build up the church presence in our community. We look forward to compassionate guidance and support as we seek to revitalize our own spiritual growth. With her history of community outreach, we look forward to seeking new ways to serve our neighbors and transform the lives of others. Not only are we looking forward, but we are currently enjoying energetic and engaging sermons, as well as monthly joint worship to include Daybreak and Adoration. We are studying some basic tenets of our faith, like how to pray at our new Wednesday morning Bible study. We are also enjoying a renewed engagement with our preschool as Pastor Liz holds bi-weekly worship with our little ones and their families in the sanctuary. Pastor Liz also brings professional music experience. And for a lot of us, music is a very important part of our faith. And we look forward to expanding our love of music with the local community, with Pastor Liz's can-do and will-do leadership at CBPC. In recognizing the wonderful leadership skills Pastor Liz brings to CBPC, we must also celebrate the wonderful life experiences she brings to us also. Pastor Liz is a daughter, sister, aunt, but most importantly, a wife to George and a mother to her boys, William and Gregory. Some of us, more mature members, can relate to Pastor Liz as a daughter maybe even a granddaughter, and for the young moms as a sister and a friend. We welcome you with open arms to our CVPC family, and we look forward to celebrating with you all for many years to come. Finally, CVPC is alive again. We have so much to look forward to under the leadership of Pastor Liz. We can't wait to share this walk of faith with you, supporting and encouraging you all the way. Thank you for choosing us. Now is the time in our service when we take our offering. I always struggle with words to come up with when opening about giving our offering and receiving our offering. But we give because what has been given to us. We give because of the gracious love of Jesus Christ that is in all of our lives. And today, I know this complicates things, but today we are taking two special offerings and I wanted to clarify that. The first offering that we, special offering that we're taking is for Bob Davis's family, which if you, make sure you put that on an envelope. All of the loose offering today will go to the George McGinnis Scholarship for the Presbytery, which is for people who are preparing to be pastors in our Presbytery. They get a small scholarship from our Presbytery, and the offerings that are taken at ordinations and installations go to that scholarship, plus our regular offering as well. So three offerings, we're Presbyterian, we're Christians, three in one. Let's, let's do this thing. Let us now give of our tithes and offerings. Would the ushers please come forward?
us use these tithes and offerings for your glory, that the light of your love may shine in this world, and that each and every one of us would live in your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the table for all who proclaim Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and who celebrate this day the work that Christ is doing in all of our lives. And so today, as we celebrate this service of communion, may we remember that this is not Chula Vista's table, this is not the prostitutes table. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and he blessed it and broke it, saying, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And after supper, in the same manner, he took the cup and he blessed it and he poured it out, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. All of you do this in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, our Creator. You formed us in your image, loved us with an everlasting love, and graced us with gifts for serving. In covenant with your people, Israel, you raised up leaders, judges, monarchs, and prophets to show us your path of truth and nurture us in righteousness. When we were faithless and would not follow, you forgave and returned us to your way. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your only beloved, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. By your Holy Spirit, he anointed all who would follow him to live in a new life in your love. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of heaven and with all the faithful of every time and place, who forever sing to the glory of your name. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Baptized as one among us, he received the gift of your Holy Spirit and claimed his calling as a servant of your reign. Jesus proclaimed good news to the poor and by the power of your word set people free from all that bound them. He broke open the bread of life to all who were hungry and upon the hurt and the lost poured out the living waters of your grace. In humble obedience, Jesus went to his death on the cross and was raised up by your power to reign in glory. In the resurrection, the gifts of the Spirit were poured out upon your people, that the church might embrace his ministry and live as his body in the world. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate the joy of the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives might proclaim the one crucified and risen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless 
may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the holy Christ in the world. O God, by water and by spirit, you have claimed us as your own and anointed us for your service. Build up the body of Christ in your love and equip the church for the work of ministry. Make us one body in Christ where each one's gifts are honored and used for the good of all. We all submit to one another in humility and the bond of the Holy Spirit. Send us out into the world to do justice, to show mercy, and to walk humbly with you in trust and faith. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until that promised day of resurrection, when with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, and with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join together in partaking our gifts. The body of Christ broken for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Would you pray with me? <coughs> Lord God, may this meal nourish us to be sent out. May it nourish us to be who you have called us to be. And may it transform us as you continue to transform us. As your people this day and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now let us stand and sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
transformed church of Jesus Christ who goes into the world, who risks life and limb to serve the kingdom of God. And now go in the grace, peace, and love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Don't forget the reception down at the Family Life Center right immediately after this service to uh, honor uh, Pastor Liz's uh, installation as uh, pastor. <laughs>